Well, thank you very much for that uh, great introduction. It's, it's wonderful to be here today with you at uh, Millersville University. I'm uh, pleased to participate in this conference and to uh, bring, bring to you some uh, of my learning and experience around food systems. Um, you know, the first question that really comes up is what does food security or sustainability have to do with securing our future? You know, uh, we just heard a very uh, informed uh, presentation from very deep experience about what's happening in terms of uh, war, conflict, um, conflicts in commerce. But what I say is without a secure and sustainable food system, it's hard for me to actually imagine a secure future at all. And whether we're talking about uh, famine in uh, East Africa, which you heard something about, or whether you're talking about the uh, what we've been hearing about the Arab Spring, which you know you don't hear a lot of reports about it, but one of the primary reasons for the initial uprisings happening in the Middle East, in North Africa, and places around the world is that we've had a real spike in food prices, spike in the basic price of grains, of wheat, of corn, of rice. And you know, for those of us in this country who spend an average of 10 or 11% of our income on food, uh, a significant increase in prices maybe hurt, hurts us a little bit, but we can withstand it no problem. When you spend 50 to 80% of your income on food, like many people in other parts of the world, when these basic food prices uh, go high, you know, they increase by 50% or 80%, uh, your only option is to go down to one meal a day. And that starts causing a lot of unrest. So having sustainability and food security in our system is, every, is, is very important in terms of security. But I want to talk today also about what's happening here in the United States. And this graphic you see is sort of depicts not just an individual uh, you know, gaining a few pounds over their lifetime, but what's happened to uh, our entire population in this country over the last 30 years, where in some cases the incidence of overweight and obesity has increased, has tripled or quadrupled. Um, something that, had, that sort of surprised me, a statistic I heard some um, former military generals say that like 75% of 17 to 24 year olds, or 18 to 24 year olds right now, those young people who would be most likely to go into military service, 75% are unfit for induction into our military service right now in this country. And the sole reason is not uh, obesity, but it's the largest single reason why young people are being turned away who want to go into military service. So it's another way to think about food system sustainability and food security and the you know, secure future overall. So when I talk about food security today, I'm using a definition that was uh, given to us by the US Department of Agriculture. It's very simple, access by everybody at all times to enough nutritious food for an active, healthy life. That if that's not the case in your household, then you would be considered a food insecure household. And in the United States, uh, about 14 to 15% of our population in the US is considered food insecure. You know, it depends on where you are uh, and so forth. It, it shifts for, depending on, on uh, income and, and zip code, but overall about 14 to 15%. But worldwide, we know right now there are about 925 million people, almost a billion people, living in chronic hunger, living in food insecure situations. So first of all, what are some of the causes of that? Uh, so one of the causes of, is lack of agriculture investment over a long period of time, especially investment for crops that are grown for local consumption versus crops that are grown for export to raise money. So a lot of investment has happened uh, in developing countries or emerging countries, a lot of, a lot of investment in, the, in agricultural infrastructure, but the investment has primarily been for those crops that farmers grow to export, to raise money to bring hard currency back into the country, which has undermined investment in the uh, infrastructure needed for local food systems. Another cause of this kind of food insecurity is the fact that 
um, more and more our food crops are being diverted into use for biofuels. In the United States, uh, about one third to 40 percent, 33 to 40 percent of our entire corn crop. It's the largest crop we grow in, grow in this country, grown on uh, more acres than any other crop. 35 to 40 percent of that crop right now is diverted into making uh, corn-based ethanol, which means it's not being used for uh, either livestock feed or export. Climate and weather is another issue. You know, no matter what you believe about climate change and global warming, there's no doubt that if you look over the last few years, the incidence of uh, extreme weather events <coughs> worldwide. Uh, I guess you guys experienced a little bit of flooding here not too long ago, huh? So, you know, whether it's flooding, whether it's drought, whether it's, uh, you know, extreme uh, wind, other kinds of, of uh, climatic or weather situations, that's also impinging on the ability to produce enough food to feed everybody. And then finally, whether it's commodity speculation, you know, it's only been in the last uh, 20 years or so that food commodities, those, those non-perishable commodities like corn, soybeans, wheat, rice, that they have actually are trading now on the uh, you know, world trade markets, just like uh, corporate bonds and stocks, which can cause wide swings, wide volatility in price, just like you see in the stock markets. But put all that together, and we know that in many places in the world, food prices have really gone up, especially in the last two or three years. So you know, it could be uh, partly due to more expensive oil, because our food system is almost entirely dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, decline in farm production for some of the other reasons I just talked about, weather disruptions. But we know that there are historically low grain reserves worldwide, which means that the demand for that grain is outstripping supply and or is much, uh, puts a lot of pressure on supply and prices go up. So lots of reasons why there's this kind of food insecurity it's not getting much better. I mean, if I had this slide up 10 years ago, um, we would have seen uh, just about that same number. So what are we doing to address global food insecurity? And I'll talk mostly about what we're doing in the United States, but uh, it, it also translates into what's, ha what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, for one thing, we know that, that uh, the United States, in its efforts with the UN Millennium Development Goals, has uh, really linked the issue of hunger and poverty. So it's well known that if you're going to try to uh, address food insecurity, you have to address poverty at the same time. That, that's you know, a, root, a root issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, another way to, that we've addressed over time the issue of food insecurity is uh, something called the Green Revolution. How many of you have heard about the Green Revolution? OK, so this was a program that was started by several foundations, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation primarily, back in the 1960s, and the idea was to uh, create the uh, genetic, use genetics to create crops that were actually lower in stature. So grain crops that had a lower stock could have a high yield on the head of that stock, uh, grain crop, so you could put lots more fertilizer, you could use more irrigation, you could get more grain produced, but the stock would support that grain. It was a really, uh, at first, it seemed to be a brilliant idea. And in fact, if you have the fertilizer, the pesticides, and the water that can go into that system, indeed it does produce a lot more. And so there, there's you know, documented uh, results with this green revolution approach to using plant breeding to improve genetics, improve varieties. The, the associated cost of that is that if you don't have those other inputs, these varieties don't, aren't not very well suited to high yield. So uh, what has happened with the Green Revolution, primarily in Asia, is that in some cases it has very much succeeded and helped some countries to become self-sufficient in grain production. But what it's also done is wiped out a lot of the local varieties that were much better suited to the climate there when you didn't have high inputs of fertilizer, pesticides, and irrigation water. And so uh, it's very questionable whether this is an approach that in the future is going to work that well. Uh, another way we address food security uh, has to do with this tension between food aid dependency and long-term food security. So let me give you an example of that. Uh, last January, January 2010, there's an earthquake in Haiti. 
Remember this? Okay, so the, a lot of people uh, homeless, a lot of people without food, without water. So the response of the U.S. Uh, to this human uh, condition was to send food to Haiti. Sounds reasonable, right? They eat rice in Haiti. That's a staple of their diet. Hey, you know, let's buy a bunch of rice from rice farmers in the United States, send that rice to Haiti. Sounds like a good idea, right? Well, a few months later, what happens is you start looking on the, if you go to the store, grocery store shelves in Port-au-Prince in Haiti, you find that you buy six pounds of rice that is actually grown in Haiti, and it costs you almost five and a half dollars for that six pounds. You find six pounds of rice that was produced in the U.S. and sent to Haiti, it's on sale on the shelves for less than four dollars. So what, what's happening? We're actually, our food aid is putting rice farmers in Haiti out of business. So that it sounds like a great idea to send this food for people that are hungry, but if you don't do it in the right way, if you're just sending the food, you flood their market, you get cheaper rice into their markets, you're actually undermining long-term food security in that country. And uh, in fact, not only do we have to, uh, not only do we uh, ship the, the rice that's produced by U.S. farmers, but our policies, our government policies in the U.S. insist that that rice be shipped on U.S. carriers. So again, sounds good, we should be giving jobs and income to U.S.-based businesses. Well, the problem is that's about the most expensive transportation you can get, and by some estimates, about 65% of all of our food aid that went to Haiti actually was used in transportation and shipping, and really never got to people who needed the food. Um, there's also this thing called structural adjustment, another way to address uh, global food insecurity. And what, that's, that, what that is, uh, means is with the World Bank and the uh, International Monetary Fund, as they have brought money to assist with agricultural development, in many places in the world, they've required those governments to curtail their spending on the agriculture sector. They feel, you know, the, in, in their wisdom, over years, the IMF and World Bank felt like uh, that other sectors of the economy in other countries were much more important to develop than agriculture. So if the countries want aid, they have to stop spending so much of their own money in those countries on agriculture development. And uh, it starts undermining their own agriculture in those countries. And part of this was because they wanted, the, they wanted these countries to make a commitment to decrease their own debt. Right, so, so you spend money on an African country, you don't want that country to be high in debt, stop spending money in your agricultural sector, which means stop giving credit to farmers to buy seed, tools, machinery, other technology they need, stop spending money on storage and, and uh, transportation, infrastructure. So again, um, policies that we've been part of in the United States end up undermining long-term food security in those countries. And I think the, the biggest question really is the one, is the last one, that in our, uh, as we try to address global food insecurity in the United States, um, are we assisting those in need or are we promoting U.S. agriculture and U.S. farmers? And we try to do both, I believe, and I don't think we do a very good job at trying to do both. Because it seems like uh, every time we try to do something in the interest of our own farmers in terms of food aid, we're really undermining the ability for others to create uh, food security for themselves. So what are some current efforts that may have a little more promise? Uh, there's, a, there's a project right now that's in place, uh, started by the Obama administration called Feed the Future. It's from USAID, Agency for International Development, and it is working to assist smallholder farmers. So it is money, it's not a lot of money, it it's needs to be a lot more, but it is a start, and that is specifically for uh, Infrastructure for smallholder farmers, like storage, transportation, refrigeration. Some estimates are that uh, 30 to 40 percent of everything that's produced, uh, all the food that's produced, is actually go goes to waste because there is not the infrastructure to either uh, refrigerate, store, or transport it. So a big way to create more food security in these places is simply to start cutting back, cutting down the waste. And the way you do that is to invest in this kind of infrastructure. Um, the, the World Bank also has uh, 
a new program global agriculture and food security program that's taking place now in twelve emerging countries and it is much more along the lines of investing in in small holder operations and getting reinvestment back in agriculture and i also want to mention the bill and melinda gates foundation they're now by far and away the largest foundation largest philanthropy in the world now and they are focusing a lot of their attention on food security especially in africa um, they are trying to take lessons from the green revolution in asia use what worked there and try to make it work better i think the jury is still way out on how well this is going to work They're, they are definitely putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into shifting the genetics of varieties in uh, the staple varieties for africa um, but whether genetic engineering or plant breeding alone is going to do the job who knows and uh, it's really going to take a lot more investment in infrastructure for small-scale farming. So my hope is that that's a place where they're going to put more of their resources. But now I want to shift to uh, talk a little bit about the United States, a little bit about what's happening here in the U.S. with food security. I want to start that by telling a personal story. So when I was age 36, uh, since I was about your age, most of you students here, I, I've been battling a disease called ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. When I was age 36, that, uh, I had such a severe flare-up of that disease that my digestive system had basically shut down. And I found myself in the hospital. So I'm lying in the hospital, I've got uh, you know, IV tubes in my arms, pumping me full of steroids, of prednisone, to try to cool the inflammation down, and the, the doc comes in the room and says, you know, if this inflammation doesn't cool down by the end of the week, our only option is surgery. So I'm looking at living the rest of my life without a colon. And um, a couple days later, the doc comes back in and says, you know, before we do that, we gotta see if you can eat something. So what comes to me, you know, in the, in the hospital? You start getting the picture, right? It's a, a dinner tray with a roast beef, a pile of mashed potatoes, and some big ass piece of cake, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I, I say to myself, whoa, this is not the food I need to get my body healthy. I know that. So I pick up the phone and call a friend and say to her, will you please come save my life this week? Would you make me some, some brown rice, tofu, and steamed greens and bring it to me in the hospital? Well, she did, and, you know, knock on wood, I got better, and I'm very healthy today. But while I was lying there in the hospital during that week, I thought about how fortunate I was that I knew what I needed to get myself healthy and to keep myself healthy, and I had access to it. But I also thought about all the people who don't. All the people who either don't have the knowledge or education about what they need to keep themselves healthy, or if they do, they simply don't have the access to that food. So um, there are many reasons to care about this issue. Uh, let, me, let me give you just one that might uh, hit home. So I'm... Uh, Actually, about a year ago, I'm in Philadelphia at a conference, and I'm listening to the executive vice president of the largest health insurance company in the United States. And here's what he says. He says, you know, we've looked at the trends, we've run the numbers, and if current trends continue by the year 2018, the cost of treating obesity-related illness in the United States will be $345 billion a year. $345 billion. He says when it gets to that point, it not only bankrupts our company, it's going to bankrupt this country. Because if it gets to that point, I don't know how many of us will be able to afford health insurance. And the burden on all of us to pay for medical care for those who are uninsured, that burden is going to be more than we can bear. And folks, this is all of our future coming at us very fast. And all that happens a few years down the road because we're not doing enough today to shift the food environments so that everybody has access to the food they need to live a healthy life, so that everybody is food secure. And on, in the wealthiest, wealthiest country in the world, we can do this. Now, the, uh, the issue uh, that I raise around uh, obesity and diet-related illness is not the only symptom of what I say is a broken food system. And, and if, you, uh, if you read my book, you're gonna see that I don't talk very much about problems that need to be solved. I talk about a food system that is as broken as our healthcare system, our energy system, our education system, a food system that needs to be redesigned. And some of the symptoms of that broken food system 
yes, there's a symptom of diet-related illness and you know the obesity epidemic that I've talked about, but what you see on that map, so that's uh, the northern area of the Gulf of Mexico, that's the state of Louisiana, and the red part there is where the Mississippi River runs right into the Gulf of Mexico, and that red part is called a dead zone. So that's an area where there's so little oxygen in the water, it can't support any life. No fish, no shellfish, nothing. It's Right now, if you measure the area of the dead zone of the Gulf of Mexico, it's the size of the state of Massachusetts. It's one of 150 such dead zones all around the United States, 450 worldwide that have, that have been found. The primary cause of that dead zone is runoff of agricultural chemicals all up and down the Mississippi River, from Minnesota all the way down to Louisiana. So I say another symptom of our broken food system. We can't be treating our, our land and our water like this if we're going to have a sustainable and food secure future. Or if you think of the people who really do the work to get us our food, I call them the invisible workforce in our food system, farm workers and food workers. The way the conditions under which they live, the conditions under which their children are forced to live, the wages they're paid, something that none of us would put up with for a minute. And it's not just farm workers, it's, it's food processors and some back of the house restaurant workers in this country too. I say that, uh, you know, I call them the invisible workforce. They're the folks who actually do the work to get us our food. If they all stopped working tomorrow, about three days from now, all of us would go hungry. So another symptom of our broken food system. Food deserts, another symptom, places where uh, there, there's very little access to healthy food, and we'll talk about that a little more. I've, I've got a few videos I'm going to show during this presentation. Let's try to liven it up, and I'm going to show you some examples of this. So what are our policy, our current policy responses to all this? Um, I mean, in some ways, few and far between, but if I think of our policy response primarily be, being federal policy around what we call the Farm Bill, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, you know, our policy responses in agriculture have basically been two things. You know, give monetary support to farmers, to the largest farmers that are producing uh, non-perishable crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, rice, and cotton. Give them subsidies, put some money into conservation to try to help them do it in a more environmentally responsible way, and um, give uh, food stamps to folks who can't afford, who don't have high enough income to buy sufficient food. So food stamps, commodity subsidies, a little conservation money, a few other small programs. But that's been our response. That's been our policy response. I'm going to suggest in a few minutes uh, some much better ways for us to have response in this country to policies around food security. But before I do that, I want to look at, you know, the, what I've talked to you about is up until now is sort of, I, I put that in the bad news category. I mean, yes, there are issues, there are problems, there are symptoms of a broken food system, but I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about the good news, about the solutions. And I'm going to start that by uh, showing you a couple of videos of projects that uh, are working to make a difference, one in Africa and one in Cambodia. And then, then I want to talk a little bit about uh, why those are making such a difference. Security means access to sufficient food to lead a healthy and productive life at all times by all people. The food security situation today is relatively bleak in that almost 800 million people in the developing world don't have enough food to eat on a daily basis. Most people who are food insecure live in the developing world in poor rural villages that fall outside of the global market. Often they do not have the money to purchase food from outside sources, yet they also lack the skills and resources to grow their own food. While there are many possible solutions to the problem of food insecurity, the community-based approach has been particularly successful. Using this approach, communities are producing their own food locally in a healthy, environmentally sound way with additional benefits like economic growth and empowerment of the community. Within communities, there are solutions that exist. Maybe people didn't realize they existed and they need to be brought out, drawn out of systems. 
Um, people have the wherewithal to transform themselves and their community. And there's very good evidence that that shows that food insecurity can really be dealt um, a, a blow to end it. Um, but we just have to realize that those possibilities are there. In rural South Africa, in the northern province of Limpopo, children were dying from hunger and malnutrition. One mother whose child had been hospitalized several times with severe malnutrition was desperate for a solution. She lacked the necessary knowledge and resources to grow her own food, so she turned to the WIT School of Public Health for help. The women asked me to go and assist them to stop their children. So the project that we established with the women was called Katholanang Health and Nutrition Education Center. What we did was to make deep trench gardens. Deep trench gardening is a simple process. A four by eight foot trench is dug to a depth of a few feet, then filled with fertile soil. When the project began, Ten women in the village came together to learn the technique. Armed with knowledge, they were able to produce enough food to drastically improve the health of their children. Only four doll-sized trench gardens prepared a, a, a month apart each would be able to provide fresh vegetables the whole year through. The women would work in groups and would rotate together from one house to the next. You work on a Monday in one home and you dig a two spade length by one spade length type of trench garden and then you go to the well to fetch water together. By the time the week ends, the seedlings are appearing on the garden of the one woman. The women also learned other creative strategies to garden organically, using very little outside resources. We used no, nothing that we actually bought from the, uh, uh, from the market, like manure, like pesticides. The women used the natural uh, resources that they had. The success of the initial village became known in the province and the women helped to establish similar groups in 43 other villages. I don't know how to explain the whole impact that this has had. It has not only managed to address the problem of starvation, it has also united the people. Some of the signs of success are not tangible ones, but when you actually see the women and the children, and you see that the child who used to cry with a very long cry and dry, and suddenly when you sing, because we sing and dance in the villages, when you sing and dance and you see this child also singing and shaking, then you actually are very happy. <laughs> In rural Cambodia, food security remains a distant goal. More than 84% of the population lives in poverty. The villagers rely entirely on agriculture to sustain them. But few can afford seeds or farming tools. Poor health, malnutrition, inadequate housing and illiteracy are constant. Like any poverty and hunger stricken village, they have really nothing else 
nowhere else to go but uh, rely on whatever they can get in the village. Definitely in these uh, food insecure villages, in Thai populations go one meal a day for up to six months during the year. Despite these conditions, the Hex Cambodia program is making great strides through a community-based approach in 68 rural villages. Two specific initiatives, the Rice Seed Credit Bank and the Health and Nutrition Resource Improvement Campaign, vastly improve food security in these villages by helping people to provide for themselves. Before Hex's involvement, Farmers in this village had to pay as much as 240% interest on rice seeds purchased at the beginning of each planting season. Faced with no option but to pay this high interest rate to local lenders, farmers found themselves further and further in debt. This uh, specific project is about rice seed credit bank. It is about uh, supplying sufficient and appropriate seeds to the farmers during the planting season. The rice bank lends seeds to farmers at the beginning of the planting season. At harvest time, the farmers will return the seeds plus interest of five to 10%, 20 times less than they paid before the project began. With adequate supply of seeds, the farmers tend to their land for the planting season. This season, they will be able to produce enough rice to feed their families, plus save enough to pay back their loan. The Health and Nutrition Resource Improvement Campaign is another aspect of Hex Cambodia program. Nutrition officers work with villagers to provide education and skills training. Villagers attend classes on nutrition where they learn to grow vegetables to help counter various health problems. The women in the nutrition improvement campaign have had a significant effect on the health and well-being of their families. And they've learned skills which let them continue to have an impact, locally and independently. Hex Cambodia program has worked by providing education and resources to help villagers improve their lives on their own. I would say compared to the time we started, there is more food. But uh, to say that their food security is a long way to go. I mean, so much misery in um, poverty and hunger. Something can be done and things can become better slowly. Uh, and I hope it can get faster. So there's a, there's a lot to learn from uh, these kinds of projects that are working around the world, and there's many more that we could talk about. But when I think about some of the lessons, some of the big lessons from these projects, how, how important it is to build local capacity and strengthen the resiliency of communities, because what you see here are solutions that are being found within the community, not being imposed by anybody outside. It's also important to start thinking about food sovereignty or food as a human right. So rather than food being used as a way to raise uh, you know, hard currency in developing countries, that uh, we start looking at food as a basic human right, like we would view clean air and clean water. How important it is that the communities that are impacted by food insecurity have a very strong say in solutions that are created, and the power of investing in lo local infrastructure whether that local infrastructure is credit like we saw in Cambodia or the actual uh, infrastructure of uh, gardens or the infrastructure of community uh, coming together to work together like we saw in South Africa. So now let me make, make a bit of a switch and start talking about what's happening here in the U.S. in uh, the area of food security and redesigning our food system. And I, I just see good news all around me. You know, one, one of them is uh, the fact that here we see our first lady at her, at the organic garden at the White House. You know, it's pretty amazing to start seeing both that happening and uh, 
first lady michelle obama putting her primary effort into something called the let's move initiative which is all about focusing on this obesity and with them epidemic nationwide but there are many other signals of good news uh how many of you shop at farmers markets here in town all right well i don't know about you do you like going to the farmers market i mean i just love going to the farmers market wherever i am i mean it's like the happiest place in any city i, I live in ann arbor which is pretty near detroit you know detroit a lot of people have you know look at that as the poster child of all that's bad with post-industrial America. But if I get myself to the Detroit Eastern Market, one of the largest farmer's markets in the country, on a market day in right smack dab in inner city of Detroit, I will find the happiest place in that city. 20 or 35 to 40,000 people shopping there on a market day. Well, here's the growth of farmer's markets since 1994. You know, a 17% increase just since last year. Just about any sector of the economy in the last year would have uh, sort of died and gone to heaven if they had seen a 17% increase in their sector. But this is what's happening with farmers markets. And, and it's not just farmers markets for people of means. This is showing you the increase in expenditures of food stamps at farmers markets nationwide. So it's, it's people of means and people of, of uh, more modest means starting to shop at farmers markets. Now, not that I'm a total proponent of uh, you know always eating it needing to eat everything organic but I think this is a really great signal when we see this kind of increase in sales of organic food it's one of the fastest growing organic and local are two of the fastest growing segments in grocery and have been for uh, pretty much this past decade I think it's a great sign that people are paying more attention to the food they're eating where the food comes from and putting their money literally where their mouths are right but it's not only you know farmers markets and small business it's also some of the largest businesses in the country that are making a difference uh, Cisco which is you know you've, I'm sure you've all seen the trucks Cisco trucks right it's a 40 billion dollar company the largest distributor of food to restaurants and institutional food service in the country and they now have a project called integra advanced integrated pest management where they're working with farmers on 900,000 acres of production in the United States to lower the amount of chemicals they're using, fertilizer and pesticide chemicals. And these are the results over, you know, you can see it by year, but they are making huge strides in avoiding thousands of pounds of pesticides and fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers being applied to land in this country. And it's all because they have a program that basically says, you want to sell products to Cisco, you need to follow these protocols. There are many other models that I can talk about. You know, there's the uh, farm to school. There are over 10,000 farm to school projects now all over the country where, where uh, local farmers are connecting with school, with public school food service to bring locally grown food into cafeterias. And something I want to let you know about, something called Food Corps. Because some, you know, some of you might be considering or have heard about, you know, when I'm done with college, maybe I'd spend time in the Peace Corps or as an AmeriCorps volunteer. Well, the, the newest program in the AmeriCorps service volunteer um, program is called Food Corps. And it enables you to do one to two years of service in a low-income community, helping schools establish school gardens, connecting local farmers in that area with school food service. It's, I know the people who are running this program. It's fabulous. The folks who dreamed it up and are running it who are running it are in their 20s and 30s. So they, uh, they understand young folks and, and what the needs are. So uh, any of you who are interested, I'm gonna, before I'm done here, I'm gonna tell you how to connect with them. College Food Service, another place, another model that's expanding. There's something called the Real Food Challenge, which now has over 300 university and college campuses signed on to shifting 20% of all their purchasing of food onto their campus from local and sustainable sources and they're out to change a billion dollars of food purchasing by the year 2020. So something you can get involved with right here on campus. And then, you know, another expanding model are community supported agriculture, sort of subscription farming where people pay farmers up front to get a share of the harvest over the season. And there are, as of 2007, USDA, Department of Agriculture, listed over 12,000. There are now over 15,000 CSAs across the country. So all kinds of signs that, uh, that uh, these models are expanding. 
I want to now talk with you a little more in depth about a model that we are working with at Fair Food Network called Double Up Food Bucks. And Double Up Food Bucks is a pretty simple project. Basically, anybody that comes to a participating farmer's market, and we're right now doing this all across the state of Michigan, and brings their food stamp card. It's called the Electronic Benefits Transfer, EBT card. In Michigan, it's called the Michigan Bridge Card. Does anybody know what it's called in Pennsylvania? Each state. What's it called? Access. access. So it would mean people would bring what's the equivalent of their access card in Michigan to a farmer's market, and they swipe their card and get tokens to spend at the farmer's market. For every $20 they spend you know, off their, off their access card when they swipe it, they get an extra $20 worth of tokens, the tokens you see up here. And those double up food buck tokens are good for any Michigan grown fruits and vegetables. And it's a way for us to incentivize folks to bring their federal food assistance dollars to farmers markets to get fruits and vegetables, healthier food for their families while supporting local agriculture. The money goes right in the pocket of local farmers. So uh, by now you know how much I like using video to tell a story. So here's the story of Double Up. Here's the story of Double Up Food Bucks with about a four minute video. In a city like Detroit, finding healthy, fresh, and locally grown produce is very difficult. Most Detroiters have to rely on neighborhood stores that carry very little fresh food. When you have no access to healthy, fresh food, you're forced to choose foods that are going to be less healthy for you. And that's what's happening in communities like Detroit. This is the central part of Detroit. All my life, I grew up here. With a big family, it's very hard if you don't have a uh, degree or a career to be able to feed your family and provide the necessities because things are constantly getting more expensive and you want to be able to feed them healthy. And if you're not making, you know, more than minimum wage, it's very expensive to buy fresh fruits and vegetables. It's very expensive. and we grow 60 or 70 different vegetables, it's a little tough. We're direct marketing to people up there in Detroit, and we give them fresh stuff right off the farm. It hasn't traveled 10,000 miles. You have the best quality food anywhere in the world right here. Everybody has a fundamental right to healthy, fresh, and sustainably grown food. If fresh produce is available, and if it's affordable, folks will buy it. And, and they're, they're ready to buy it, they want to buy it, there is demand. Double Up Food Bucks is a project of the Fair Food Network that provides shoppers on food stamps, which means they have the Michigan Bridge Card, greater access to healthy, fresh food in a way that's affordable for them. Double Up Food Bucks is actually an incentive program for folks to use their bridge cards to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables. And so if a person brings their bridge card to a place like Eastern Market and they swipe $20 off their bridge card to use in the market, they can get $20 in Double Up Food Bucks tokens that can be used for Michigan grown produce in the market as well. Double Up Food Bucks is great. It puts a little bit more money in the farmer's pockets, but it also gives households that are really stretched financially the chance to uh, improve their diets. By going to Easter Market, by being able to get double money, spend 20, get 20, is, is such an advantage. You can try different things, different fruits and vegetables that you would have never tried because you can't afford to try them, but with this, I can feed them like more fruits and vegetables. We yeah. used them up. <laughs> we both used about $20. $20. Yeah. And then also, 
we're, we're also supporting Michigan. The Bill Bluff coupons is really helping us. I mean, we got a big pile of these. The money that gets redeemed with those double up food buck tokens goes directly in the pockets of Michigan farmers. It does so through the mouths and bellies of low income kids. We eat veggies and fruits and we eat red strawberries, tomatoes, all kinds of things. Double up food bucks is not only helping families eat healthier food now. It has the potential for shifting eating habits over a lifetime. So we've had that program in place in Michigan now. This is our third year. And uh, I've never been a believer in if you build it, they will come. So you gotta build it and tell people about it. So we've done radio ads all over Michigan, all over Detroit. This is an example of a billboard. There are 50 billboards up now all over Detroit with this program. We've done direct mail to uh, food stamp clients uh, partnering with the state of Michigan. And um, so uh, the question is, how's it working? Well, this gives you an idea. This is how that program is working. This just shows you what's happened over the last three years, 2009, 2010, 2011. The number of markets involved and the amount of money that is going directly into the pockets of Michigan farmers uh, through this program. And in 2011, that's only through, uh, that's through about last week. We still have about two more months of the market season to go. So I'm predicting we're gonna hit over a million dollars of the in that with the program this year first question that comes up is you know so how do you sustain that who, who pays the extra twenty dollars and how do you sustain it well right now the extra twenty dollars is spent is paid for by foundations giving grants so charity but I'm going to talk with you in just a moment about how some plans for making this more sustainable over time so by now you know I I hope that I am uh, relaying to you my belief that we cannot solve the food system one problem at a time that we need to really redesign our food system we need to redesign it so that it does provide healthy food for everybody that needs it and that's what i lay out in my new book that dr arnold had uh, told you about my new book fair food growing a healthy sustainable food system for all which uh, i'm happy to sign for you uh, if you'd like to get a copy after our session here this afternoon um, but in in my book i lay out four principles that we need for a redesigned food system so we do have a food secure future for everybody. Principles of equity, diversity, ecological integrity, and economic viability. Equity so everybody has access to food. Diversity so that we have a much more diverse food system biologically, agronomically, socially, and economically. Ecological integrity so we get rid of those dead zones. They, they go away, we don't keep creating them. And economic viability, after all, the food system is a market-based system. So the way it's going to sustain itself into the future is in the marketplace. So how do we do it? How do we redesign a system? Well, I say you redesign a system by looking at how it's designed right now. And the way the primary design of our system right now comes from decades and decades of public policy in something called the Farm Bill. It is an omnibus piece of legislation that's reauthorized every five years in Congress. And um, it's going to be up for reauthorization sometime in the next 12 to 18 months. It was started in uh, 1862 when the U.S. Department of Agriculture started and land grant universities started and colleges were established. But it was actually during the Depression and the farm crisis after that, during the Dust Bowl years, that we came up with ideas in this country to create commodity programs to stabilize prices because there were huge price, price swings. And at that time, you know, we had over 50% of our population on the land farming. And we had to do something to stabilize income. We also put in place conservation programs because after the Dust Bowl years, we knew we had to start farming in ways that would save our soil. Uh, the Farm Bill in the early days also included services for rural communities and even in the early days, emergency food aid for those who needed it. 
Over the years, the Farm Bill has evolved to everything from uh, uh, point of origin labeling to uh, a, an energy title in the Farm Bill uh, to help put wind energy on farms to what's called specialty crops, money to support the uh, production of fruits and vegetables by farmers to uh, farmers market promotion programs. It's the Farm Bill that actually brought us the USDA organic seal before that happened about 15 years, about 10 years ago actually before that happened. Every state could have their own rules about what was organic and what wasn't. We now have a federal program that came through the Farm Bill. And finally what the Farm Bill does is it, it also provides uh, money for crop insurance and for farmers who face uh, different kinds of disasters like flooding. In 2008, which was the last time the Farm Bill, it wasn't called the Farm Bill, it was called Food Conservation and Energy Act. It included 15 titles. The title just meant that was, you know, uh, a, a bill for flows of money or regulation existed under one of those titles. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Look at all those titles, you know, starting with commodity title, which are the subsidies, farm subsidies, all the way conservation, trade, nutrition, credit, all the way down. Where do you think the largest amount of money goes? Which title? Any ideas? You know, you know, it's not a quiz, I'm not gonna grade you on it. What do you think? <coughs> subsidies, I saw one. How many think subsidies? What other ideas do you have? Trade. Trade. Yeah. Energy. So, let me show you where it goes. When the 2008 Farm Bill was authorized, it was authorized with 68% of all of the money going to nutrition. That means food stamps, or you know the equivalent of the access card in Pennsylvania, the bridge card in Michigan. Since 2000, since this farm bill was put in place, and because of the recession that's happened since then, if you look at the actual numbers of money being spent from USDA, through the you know authorized by the farm bill, spent through our Department of Agriculture, uh, close to 75% of all the money that's spent is being spent on nutrition, which means food stamps. 75 cents of every dollar we spend. Uh, some of you who thought subsidies, that's in that 12%. So uh, I'm not surprised that, um, that you didn't get this one right. Not many people do, but I think it's really important to understand because if we are gonna shift our food system in this country, it means paying attention to where our resource flows are going. This is the blueprint for how our food system looks, and it means we really have to address how we're spending money on uh, nutrition. So it comes to what I believe are our opportunities for the next time around, and what I'm saying is we have opportunities to shrink our food deserts and expand our regional food systems, and how do you do it? Take a successful program like Double Up Food Bucks, and rather than having it solely funded through philanthropic or charitable resources, start bringing our federal dollars. Take some of that 70% that we're spending on uh, food assistance and use it for incentives. Use it to incentivize folks to bring that flow of dollars, which if you look at the, in total, it's about $70 billion a year. Take some of that $70 billion a year and start channeling it to help families like the one you saw in the video get access to healthier food while supporting the local farmers and supporting our local agriculture. So part of our work at, at Fair Food Network is about working toward um, redesigning this food system by redesigning the farm bill. We're focused on solutions and a term I love, solutionaries. And that came to me from a group of uh, college students up in Boston. I was talking with them a little while ago and they said, you know, we're tired of hearing about the problems and reading about all the challenges of our food system. We're ready to talk about solutions. So we've decided we're gonna become solutionaries. So I've now joined their ranks as a fair food solutionary. And I'm inviting you to join their ranks as well. So, you've heard a lot from the previous speaker today about many ways to get involved. I'm gonna give you another one. It's pretty simple. Number one, I'm gonna uh, pass this around. Put your email on here and you will become part of our Fair Food uh, Communications uh, community. We have about 7,000 people nationwide that we're communicating with on a regular basis, letting them know what's happening. And when it comes time, to have your voice heard on things like the Farm Bill, we're gonna ask you to do that. So if, if you're interested, put your name and email on there, send it around. We'll make sure we get you on our list. 
But another way that you can get involved and engaged with things like Food Corps that you heard me talk about or the Real Food Challenge is if you go to our Fair Food Network website, fairfoodnetwork.org, and look for the Fair Food List on our website, you will find a list of literally hundreds of organizations working all across the country on issues around sustainability and food security in the food system. And um, it will be, it's a very easy way for you to go see who's doing what and how to get yourself involved in an area that uh, you feel strongly about. So um, I want to thank you for your attention during this uh, talk this afternoon, and I know we now have uh, a little bit of time for questions and discussion.